It's a pleasure being here in New Zealand at University of Canterbury, and I want to thank every single one of you who's uh, taken this opportunity of coming here tonight. I'm known as Kit Gupta. That's how I'm known as author and a speaker. And uh, just a little bit of introduction about myself. I write and I speak. Uh, different labels have been put on me of a motivational speaker, inspirational speaker, coach, transformational coach, personal development coach, and a bunch, bunch of other labels. But tonight I'm here only to talk to you about my personal experiences. I'm not here to proselytize any religion, any organization. I'm not affiliated with uh, any particular uh, principle or fundamental that is based uh, on an organization or from an organization. I'm here just to share my experiences and uh, specifically talk about empowering yourself. It's a program that I thought of creating after writing my second book called Empower the Observer uh, that some of you who might be lucky tonight may even get a copy to take home with you. And the important thing about Empower the Observer is that it focuses on you. It focuses on our experiences, the multitude of experiences that you and I have in our personal, professional, and social life. That's what Empower the Observer focuses on. Before I begin the program tonight, what I'd like to do is erect what I call as the guarding pillars. You can call these as uh, columns, as uh, my defendants, whatever you might choose to label them as. But for the sake of simplicity, I would like to call them just my guarding pillars. And these are basically uh, my defense to any of the thoughts that might occur to you guys tonight while I'm talking to you about my experiences, I'm sharing my personal story, or uh, I might be sharing my thoughts. So there would be thoughts coming in your mind, thoughts occurring in your mind, that I'm gonna plant these guarding pillars against. And this is just to help you get answers as thoughts arise uh, while you listen to me talk and we share different experiences tonight, as thoughts arise in your mind, these pillars will perhaps help you get some answer. The first pillar that I'm going to erect tonight on this Parthenon of defense for me and also for you to help get some answers is the pillar that has these letters etched on it that say, I don't know everything. And at the outset of this program, I would like to tell you that I might not have answers to every single thing that you might be looking for. Some of you might be here for answers about your professional career. Some of you might be here to excel in your relationships. Whatever that question might be in your mind, I'm happy to say that I don't have an answer to everything. The second pillar has etched on it the words, Everything is refutable. Right from day one, since I've been talking to audiences around the world, this is something that I passionately try to share with my audience that every single thing is refutable. What might be true today may not be true tomorrow. So there is this concept of understanding that you can repudiate every single thing that I talk about tonight. Some of the concepts that might hold true in my personal life or might be true as my belief system may not be true for you. And it's perfectly all right to actually repudiate, to refuse to accept uh, what I say. You don't have to accept every single thing that I talk to you about tonight, whether it's my experience or my suggestion or recommendations to you about making improvement in your personal relationships, professional career, or social life. Third column says spell of words. Now, it's very important for you to understand that you and I have been coached 
by our academic institutions, our families and our society and people we've seen around us that we grew up with, that words have to make sense. Every single thing, nouns, verbs, and adjectives, and everything in grammar needs to make sense. The words we choose to express certain things, they have to be appropriate. But I'd like to remind you that it's very important if you'd like to gain the most of what I discussed tonight, please have an open mind. Don't get spellbound. Do not let yourself get entangled in words. Beneath words, there is a hidden meaning in what I'm talking about. And I recommend to you, I suggest to you that you look after or you go after finding that deeper underlying meaning as opposed to getting yourself entangled into words. The fourth column says, thinker's conundrum. Now, a lot of times what's going to happen is if I'm suggesting something to you, the thinker inside of you might have a thought rise inside and feel like whether I'm telling you to do it or to not do it. So remind yourself, it might just be a conundrum. It might just be the thought process that you have been coached to think with. That might be the only reason why you find yourself in a predicament like this. And that might be able to uh, answer some of the question that rise in your mind. And this last column on this Parthenon of Defense is a column that tells you about this illegitimate child, this little bastard that I've been carrying around with me in myself ever since I can remember. And his name is EGO. E-G-O, ego, yes. Uh, during this event, at some point of time, if you feel like that there are certain things that do not jive with your principles, and I might come across to you as a person who might be imposing, even though I try my best not to impose any of my strategies or principles onto anyone, if that happens, remind yourself that it perhaps might be because of this little bastard, this illegi illegitimate child that's inside of me. I want to come clean and tell you that, yeah, I, it is inside of me. And perhaps it's inside of every single one of us. Of these several experiences that I've talked about in the book, Empower the Observer, in my journey to different parts of the world, in this travel that I do, talking to so many people from all walks of life, I've often asked people the question, what do you think your purpose is? What is the reason you think you're here? Is there something specific that you think you want to accomplish while you're here on this planet? And I've got various answers. I've got a huge array of answers, and I'd like to share some of them with you. A teacher in Ireland that I met who's a good friend of mine, she said that her purpose is to serve others. She volunteers her time in Northeast India at a missionary in Darjeeling, where she helps these little kids who are orphans. And she calls that injustice to these children who are not being given the basic necessity of good education, shelter, or food, or just a good upbringing. So she feels like that her purpose is to help these children. An employee in India, in an engineering firm of mine, once said to me that his purpose is to give everything to his family, give good education, take care of their basic needs, and just fulfill whatever it is that his family needs. I had a coworker in uh, Dallas, Texas, that I asked, asked this question. He had a young baby boy that was unplanned. And I asked him the same question, and he said that he feels that his purpose of life is to give everything he did not have to his son. Everything that he felt was 
not a part of his life that should have been a part of his life, he would want to make sure that his son gets it. And if I go around this room asking every single one of you about purpose, I might get different definitions as well. But when I look at these different answers, these different definitions, I feel that there is something common across the board. And I've found that most people, and you might disagree with me, some of you might have a different opinion, but I believe that most people that are living a life, are perhaps living a life under what I called as a bell curve of living, and they're living right in this center of this bell curve, where making money is our primary purpose of life. Most of us make making money our primary purpose of our life. Let me explain this. For many of us, it begins with education in school. When we're little, we're told, from, we're told by our families to work hard in school to get good grades or good marks. So during that time, we make education or getting good score in our school as our primary purpose. Eventually, when we get to a point where we have to look for a good college, then we're told to do good in SATs or GREs or TOEFLs or whatever test we might have to take in order to get into a good educational academic institution, we do that. We make that as a purpose. Eventually, once we get into a good college, getting a good GPA or graduating with honors with a degree that can help us get a good job becomes our purpose. Moving forward, once we get a good job and we start making money, then we make our purpose of life to go up the ladder, go higher on the corporate ladder or whatever it is that we might choose to do. If you find a good life partner, then you eventually get married and have kids. Now your primary purpose becomes or now transforms into the purpose of fulfilling the needs of your family. Like one of the employees back in, in India said, he wants to fulfill every single need of his family. So many of us go back into doing better in our jobs, climbing up the ladder or doing better in our professions so that if we are at tier one, we can go to tier two. From manager level, we can go to director level. From director level, we can go to the vices, the vice president. So we go back into our jobs looking for promotion and growth. If you really look at this whole idea of looking for purpose of your life, for many of us, I would say, it goes back into finding our purpose in our professions, which in reality is not just growth in our profession, but the reason why we go back into our professions is to make more money. And for many of you sitting here tonight, I can say that perhaps you too might be thinking of going in a profession or doing something professionally that would make you more money. But what I'd like to remind you is this experience of finding your purpose in life or knowing what you really want to do in your life. If making money is one of the purposes of your life, personally, I can tell you that I think it's finding your purpose in a wrong place. Another piece that I want to share with you about this experience of purpose that I also talk about in the book, Empower the Observer, as a separate chapter is under this bell curve of living that I described about, where many of us live in the center of this bell curve, there are outliers. The ones living in the center of this bell curve are mostly driven by money. However, there are outliers living on the outside of this bell curve 
who perhaps might be more inclined towards working selflessly without an interest in making money as the purpose of their life. For instance, the life of Mother Teresa or Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr., Malala Yousafzai, and there's so many different examples that we know from modern times to going back all the way to hundreds of centuries, people who have made selfless service as purpose of their life. But whether you're living in the center of this bell curve, whether your purpose is to make money or work in a job and continue to make money as your purpose of your life, or working as selfless person towards making an improvement in others' lives, there's a common factor that drives us in whatever it is that we do. And I call this as the desire to arrive at a state of well-being. It's a state that we all want to be in. Tranquil, ecstatic, happy, content, fulfilled, excited, whatever it is that you would like to call this state of well-being, whatever label you might want to put on it, it's a state that we all want to be in at all times.